Hi, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Packers Unscripted. From Packers.com, I am Mike Spofford, joined, as always, by my trusted colleague, Weston Hodkowitz, coming to you here from our studios at Lambeau Field. And unfortunately, Wes, this is our season-ending episode of Packers Unscripted because the Packers fell to the 49ers in the NFC Divisional Playoffs. Saturday night out in Santa Clara, the final score was 24-21. to And the long and the short of it is missed opportunities early, missed opportunities late, and the 49ers were able to, in my opinion, quite frankly, escape with a home playoff victory that sent the Packers back to Green Bay and uh, thinking about 2024. Yeah, the the word I've been using all week is survival. I thought the San Francisco 49ers survived. They didn't play particularly well. Uh, This is a team that I think you've already heard people talk out on the West Coast is going to have to play better now in the NFC Championship to get past Detroit. But for the Green Bay Packers' circumstances, I think they had a lot to do with that. Uh, I thought defensively, Green Bay set the tone early. I thought offensively, they were able to push the ball downfield, were not able to capitalize on red zone opportunities in the first half. And then, obviously, were not able to turn over the football defensively when Brock Purdy gave him a couple opportunities. Right. Conversely, Looking at San Francisco, very opportunistic in the second half. was strange because for three quarters, it was sort of the struggle between the two teams. The third quarter, for whatever reason, turned into a shootout. Yeah, but then yeah, suddenly the third quarter, the <laughs> teams are, both teams were just going up and down the field like crazy, and you have Keyshawn Nixon's long return and the fumble, <laughs> and the Packers recover it. It sort of got chaotic there yeah. for a little while. Then in the fourth quarter, things settled down, but – the Packers had, as much as they had missed on those opportunities offensively earlier in the game, they had multiple opportunities with the lead, with the ball in the fourth quarter, chances to extend that lead, and they didn't get it done. And ultimately that bit them because the 49ers were able to put together the one final drive they needed to take the ultimate uh, take the ultimate lead at the end of the game. Yeah, and, and what I've sort of been saying <clears throat> since the game was the 49ers kind of did what to the Packers, what the Packers had been doing to teams, which is – Getting finding a lead late and then being able to use the four minute offense, getting the running game going, moving the chains. Green Bay actually did pretty well in early down situations, but Brock Purdy give him credit, give the, the Niners receivers credit when it came to third and long, third and nines, third and tens. They found ways to stay on the field, and Green Bay could not get off of it. Ultimately, Christian McCaffrey showed up. Brock Purdy showed up, and when you play a team that's that good and that talented, Michael, you have to capitalize on your opportunities. When you don't, you find yourself in the position the Packers are today. Yeah, that's the thing. I think I think when you look back at this game, the the Packers had the Packers had opportunities to put even more pressure on the 49ers than they did because um, when the Packers were trailing in this game, they only trailed by a point here or there yep. you know they were right in it when the Packers had the lead both in the first half and then also um in the fourth quarter when the Packers had the lead they had chances to to kind of crank up that pressure on the favored team on the 49ers by extending that lead maybe changing the tenor of the game a little bit they weren't able to do that and because the 49ers were always just within that one score they uh all they needed was the was the one drive to do it obviously you know You'd love to see what maybe would have transpired if the ending would have transpired differently. If Andres Carlson makes the kick and the Packers go up by seven, then if the 49ers go down and score, it's a tie game instead of being in desperation mode with a minute to go. You know, maybe the game goes to overtime or something. All, like all these things um, that you know, sort of the the what ifs and and woulda, coulda, shouldas. Um, when it's all said and done, you know, for me and I think I think I speak for a lot of Packers fans in this regard for me processing processing the loss you're kind of caught in between two places because i've been doing this long enough to know that that being the hot team at the end of the season having the kind of mojo that this packers team had is rare it doesn't happen that often and when it does happen you want to try to maximize it as 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 best you can and unfortunately it, you know, as well as the Packers played for the majority of the game in San Francisco, they just weren't able to get it done. And seeing a hot team with a hot quarterback and, and that kind of mojo come up short is really tough. But then the other side, when you talk about being in between things, the other side of it is what the future holds for this team. I mean, the biggest question that needed to be answered in 2023 is do the Packers have a franchise quarterback? And I don't know when the season started 
if we would be sitting here doing a January show saying unequivocally the Packers have that answer, like, you know, after one season. But the Packers unequivocally have that answer. They have their franchise quarterback. That's what needed to be answered. And then with all these other young players on offense growing around Jordan Love, you can't help but be excited for what the future holds, even though this particular moment and this opportunity getting away is still tough to swallow. Oh, it, it burns because of that reason that the team did play that well down the stretch. Jordan Love did actually mesh with these offensive weapons as well as he did. And Mike, what impressed me the most about Jordan, and, and people will point to the stats and rightfully so, that's where you know the rubber meets the road. 4,000 yards passing, 30 plus touchdowns thrown, getting a team to the NFC divisional round of the playoffs in his first year as a starting quarterback. But I go back to what happened in April, and I still had that image in my mind. I don't know if it was Stephen Huddy or whoever it was that was doing the, the social media videos of the guys walking in for the first day of the offseason program. And Jordan came in, cool, calm, and collected, having been anointed the starting quarterback, everybody kind of knowing that's the direction things are going. Aaron Rodgers would be getting traded to the Jets, and everyone would be going their separate ways. And he never backed down from it. He welcomed it. He he was the guy pulling guys together during the summer, getting them in together in California, being able to get that little bit of a workout in, that team bonding and camaraderie. Yeah. The Monday dinners, the the sitting down and breaking down film with the with the receivers when things weren't going so hot midseason. He passed every on and off the field test you want to see from a rookie quarter or first year starting quarterback. And that is what ultimately is the reason why I feel confident calling him a franchise guy. It's not that he's just talented. It's not that he just has a good arm. It's not because he was one of the hottest quarterbacks during the final stretch of the season. It's everything he did in the window of the past nine months to earn the right to be the QB1 here. And why is that important for the Green Bay Packers? Because, Michael, if you look at all the franchises around the league that have struggled to find their guy – all of the wasted equity that goes with that, the wasted draft picks, the numerous draft picks you're spending, high capital trying to find a quarterback. Green Bay managed to do it, and they have a process of doing it. And I think that was probably the most gratifying thing for me was watching Jordan Love stay true to it, understand what was asked of him for three years, being patient, and now finally seeing some of the fruits of his labor. Yeah, absolutely. And and. I don't want this to come off the wrong way in terms of talking about Jordan Love, but when you look at when you look at what happened and you, and you start to project forward into the future, the fact that Jordan Love had the ball in his hands with a minute and seven seconds on the clock, down by three points with a chance to keep the Packers season alive, and he made a colossal mistake that he knows was on him, there may be nothing better in some respects for this team. We'll see how it plays out. There may be nothing better than the new franchise quarterback being motivated by that, by that mistake at the end, the, the entire offseason leading into next year. Jordan Love isn't walking into the offseason going, I was the hottest quarterback out there, and hey, you know, we came up short. He personally is walking into the offseason going, man, like, you know, I made the type of mistake that I hadn't made for a long time, the type of mistake that I made early in the season. I wasn't making it late in the season, but I made it with the season on the line. I believe that young man, that young quarterback, is going to be supremely motivated heading into 2024. The best quote that came out of the season, and, and Matt LaFleur reiterated it after the game, but it was in the lead-up to this game, him talking about how Jordan has learned from every experience this, week, yes. this year, good and bad. It's the only thing this guy didn't have. He didn't have the reps. He didn't have the opportunity to go out and learn from success and learn from failure at the NFL level. He has that now. Yep. He's been at the highest of highs now. Eight straight games, 18 touchdowns, one interception. The reason why the Packers are in the playoffs, the way he played down the stretch, and also why they now are not going to be trying to compete for a championship in this specific year on that drive. Now, he wasn't the only guy, as you mentioned. There was defense involved with that. There was special teams involved with that. Right. But this is the position Jordan wants to be in. And when you have that much confidence in a guy's composure, in his poise, I don't worry about that being something that's going to be a deterring factor with him. I see that, at, like you said, something that is going to kind of spur him on now into this 2024 season and beyond. Yeah, as much as Matt LaFleur said on Monday, you know, when you review that game, you feel 
you know, on the Packers side of things, it shouldn't have come down to that final drive. The Packers shouldn't have been in that position to be down by three points with a minute to go and needing to score to either tie or, or, or try to win the game because of, uh, because of all the other missed opportunities and, and just, and, you know, close calls, you know, Matt, Matt LaFleur had said when he's talking about, you know, the missed field goal, which is going to be a big discussion throughout the off season as well. These games are never just about one play. No. You know, LaFleur Le, said, you know, you look at that game, there are about 10 plays, 10, you know, that, that if maybe one or two of those go the other way for Green Bay, you know, we might be talking about a different result, but, but a, that's the NFL. B, that's the NFL playoffs. When you know the margin, the margins in the regular season in this league are small enough. The margins in the playoffs get even smaller. Especially, you know, regardless that the 49ers were the one seed and the Packers were the seven seed, everybody knew the Packers were a hot team. They had a hot quarterback. Everybody was wondering how would the 49ers respond. Um, you know, with with having you know the buy and all the rest, and and you know trying to get their guys healthy, but then you know they lose Debo Samuel. That has an yep. effect on their offense as well. We saw that earlier in the season with the 49ers. So all these things that get that get jumbled into the mix in in a playoff game, and it, it's it's frustrating to come up short when you feel like the Packers for the bulk of the game were the better team. But again, it's you know, especially in the playoffs, it's about being able to finish off the game. Yep. And uh, and the Packers weren't able to do that. No, and, and it, you've been on both sides of it. I know for Packer fans, it's difficult because you felt this pain before. Yeah. Uh, there has been incidences where the Packers got into an NFC Championship game and they got beaten in Atlanta against San Francisco the first time. But there's also been these instances where it got right down to the wire and the Packers had a chance, and that's what makes it hurt more. But what's exciting about it, if you can separate yourself from that era of Packers football and what you saw this year, is that Jordan Love has his entire career ahead of him now. He has the opportunity to learn from his mistakes and be better. And most of all, Michael, i got to give credit to Andy Herman on this. He was the one that tweeted this out. If you look at how their roster is shaped for next year without re-signing any players, without signing any free agents, without making any of these draft picks, the Packers have a bulk of their core already back yes. and under contract for next year. 100%. It's not guaranteed. You have to work for it. You're not just going to be anointed another spot in the Final Four of the NFC. But with given the youth of this roster and what Green Bay was able to do this season, that's what's leads to this optimism now for what's going to happen now in Jordan Love's second year as a starting quarterback. Yeah, and I want to transition to that in terms of looking forward, but I will take care of some sponsor business here first. Sirius XM NFL Radio delivers hard-hitting analysis and up-to-the-minute NFL news that true football fanatics need 24-7, 365. And at Cousin Subs, we have something for everyone, like our Wisconsin cheese curds, mac and cheese, golden fries, and creamy shakes, all paired with your favorite sub or sub in a bowl, Cousin Subs, 50 years of better. Well, we had Matt LaFleur's final press conference of the season on Monday. We had the final open locker room uh, media availability on Monday morning. And I thought it was really, I thought it was really poignant what Matt LaFleur had to say about, you know, c- totally acknowledging there's a lot to be proud of in terms of what this team did. Yes, the disappointing, the ending is disappointing. It's bitter. It's tough. Um, and there is a lot to look forward to, but nobody's going to crown the Packers NFC North champions. Nobody's going to hand the Green Bay Packers a playoff spot in 2024 just because of how they played over the last month or so of, of uh, the 2023 and into January of 2024. It's uh, uh, all the discussion is about what are the individual players going to do in terms of seizing their off season and making the individual strides because the individual improvement that players make on their own is what will lead to the collective improvement when they all get back together for OTAs and training camp and all that. It's a, it's a process here. And, and once the games start next season, everything starts over. Everything is, everything is zero and zero, but what you do between now and then is going to determine whether whether the team that you put out there on the field next September is a better one than the one you had the previous season. Because you have to look at where they were at four months ago and where they can get to four months from now. Yeah. 
because yeah, some and guys need to rest up. They need to recover. You need to step away. You got to get your mind clear. You got to get your body back to right. full health. Yes. But as Matt Lafleur said, April fifteenth, it's going to be here, and we're less than three months away from it. The first day of the offseason program when guys can come back voluntary, obviously, but usually the starting point for most of the roster. You want to be able to show that not only can you pick up where you left off, but you're going to be one step better even then. And I think they will be because, Michael, I was absolutely blown away by what the Packers did this season, not even with the rookie class because we talk about that so often, but a guy like Bo Melton that just gets thrown in and is playing major snaps for them in important games down the stretch. Bo Melton it won't get talked about at all because they lost the game, but draws a 41-yard DPI and then makes a toe-tapping touchdown yeah. for 19 yards. For all the guys we talked about at, at receiver and cornerback going into the season, what those two positions looked like by the end of the year, that's all based on what guys were doing in practice, how they were picking the playbook up. And now those same players are going to have an opportunity to sit back, take everything in, understand the full segment of what's being asked of them, and knowing how they fit into these offenses and defenses. That's very important. You hope to get some of these guys like Eric Stokes back and players that dealt with injury this year. But Carrington Valentine now has banked 900 snaps on defense. Yeah, uh, you know th That type of stuff goes a long way because now these guys know, I played at this level, I can play at this level moving forward, and I can make plays going forward. And I think that's one of the most exciting aspects of all of this. Yeah, and I think, I think when you look at the big picture of this Packers 2023 season, I think what, what everybody has to appreciate, because it certainly never happened around here, and I don't, I'm not familiar enough with the rest of the NFL to recall a specific instance where, where it's gone like this, but within one season span of time, there was discussion as to whether the Packers were going to get a top five draft pick. Yeah. And then by the end, they were a legitimate Super Bowl contender. With the 25th draft pick. With, and, and now selecting 25th in the first yeah. round uh, come April. The, the, the ground that had to be made up, you know, the progress that had to be made in a fairly short amount of time to go from talking about top five draft pick to not just pie in the sky, but legitimate Super Bowl contender the way they were playing, it's remarkable what this team did, and that's and that goes to the personnel department, it goes to the coaching staff, it goes to the players, the young players for sticking with it, the veteran players for sticking with it as well, knowing that these young guys yep. had stuff to learn and had to, you know, the the, the veterans had to bring them along um, to a certain extent. Um, when you to me, when I whenever I, you know, really reflect back on the 2023 season, that's what I'm going to be thinking about that this Packers team was two and five in October and people were wondering how high the draft pick was going to be. And by the end of the season there, people were wondering, can this team go to the Super Bowl? Yeah. I, I I've never experienced a season like that no. before. And I think, I think that big picture part of it is something that should be appreciated. And that's why Matt LaFleur said they've earned higher expectations now yeah. for next season because that's one of the reasons why we couldn't figure it out because we didn't know what the expectations were. We really didn't know what the standard was, especially when this team's sitting at 2-5 and five and 3-6 and six, trying to figure out, okay, wh what are they going to be? What are they going to make of this season? I think a lot of that, you give, the, you give the locker room credit, you give the players credit for their own individual development, but I think some of it has to come back to Matt LaFleur too. And he was throwing bouquets – at Brian Gutekunst in his front office for finding the talent that they did, but somebody has to develop it. Somebody has to understand how to incorporate it. Yeah, Lafleur maybe in his staff, maybe than any other season I've covered here in Green Bay, found ways to play to players' strengths. Found ways to bring in a Bo Melton. Found ways to bring in a Manuel Wilson, Tucker Craft, and and find out how to best utilize their strengths to be successful on offense. And lastly, just to mention this piece of it, when you look at the defense. Had to go through a lot, and no promises have been made. Matt LaFleur said he's taken a full evaluation. We'll see where things go from here. But I do think it says a lot about those defensive players and their character, their willpower, that when things weren't going great, and even when you win a game in Carolina but you give up 30 points to a team that didn't even score any more points the rest of the season, that they didn't fold. Jair Alexander did not fold. He rallied back. Guys responded. 
And, and that goes a long way. And I think that's one of the reasons, too, when you try to figure out how this thing could look in 2024, the locker room will be different. The chemistry will be different. But I think the right pieces are in place there to ensure you're going to have the best chance to try to build on all this momentum. Yeah, I think, and, and it, it, it somewhat goes without saying, but we probably should still say it, what, what's really in place, maybe the most important thing, aside from you know the on-the-field part with the quarterback and having the franchise quarterback, the most important thing that Matt LaFleur, I believe, has put in place here is the culture. Yeah. And that's when you talk about the the bouncing back, the resiliency, the sticking together, you know, powering through the tough times. That's about the culture that's around the team. It's within the locker room. It's within every meeting room, you know, when the players are with their position coaches, when they're with the coordinators, uh, you know, all of that. And that's what got this team through things. And that culture, you know, it'll be a challenge to, it's always a challenge to ma- to maintain, to keep a really good culture like that in place over a long period of time. But that same kind of culture is what I think is going to fuel the Packers in 2024 because whatever setbacks they in, you know they encounter are going to be with those higher expectations. Yeah. So there's going to be a different dynamic to things, but you still have to have that culture to power through it and get yourself through to the other side. I think I think that's in place here, and I think that's something that uh, that's another real bright spot and, for 2024. And we'll have to see exactly how this roster shapes up, which veterans will be back. Obviously, there's a lot of business that has to get taken care of between now and the beginning of the offseason program. But I think it says a lot about Aaron Jones and Preston Smith, Rashawn Gary, Kenny Clark, guys – that maybe weren't the most vocal in the past. I, I shouldn't say that about Preston. I think he's pretty much been vocal since he's been here. But guys that maybe felt that they needed to take a step up with their vocal leadership yeah. and had to be more of guys stepping in front of the room. There wasn't a Mercedes Lewis there this season that was breaking down the huddle, right, or talking to the team after games. You don't have someone like Aaron Rodgers who's been there and done that and seen it all. You had to have guys step into that void. There wasn't any permanent captains this season. The Green Bay didn't even do it in the playoffs. But what happened was I thought you saw individuals stepping up in their own phase of the game and taking the bull by the horns. And by doing that, it's what has allowed now guys like Romeo Dobbs and some of these younger players on this roster to understand, you know what, I can be those people too. Yeah. I want to ask you a couple of big picture questions here, and then we'll move on to just looking at you know where things stand with the rest of the playoffs here moving forward. Since this is our last show for a while, I would expect we'll be back. For those wondering, we'll be back at some point before the draft, but this will be our last show for a while. And actually our last show physically in this studio because we're also moving within the building to another location. I think the, the G behind us is maybe coming along. No. It's I actually not. no, I have my dad's uh, truck outside. I'm taking that home. Oh, you're taking that yeah, home with that's you. That's gonna okay. go in the shed. All right, all right. Well, maybe maybe we'll start doing the show in your garage then. We'll stick, <laughs> we'll stick that. As up. soon as we're done shooting, we're just gonna start breaking this thing down ourselves. <laughs> yeah. so. All right. <laughs> well, here I, a couple big big picture questions for you, Wes. Aside from the quarterback situation and everything the Packers learned there and how that has been established moving forward. What was your most pleasant surprise from what you saw from this team and its development, whether it be a player, a position, or whatever the case? What was your most pleasant surprise for 2020? Aaron Jones. Uh, you can talk about being the youngest team in the National Football League and the youngest team to win a playoff game and all these different things, and it, it was impressive. But when you go back and look at how scary that situation got after the Chargers game and not sure if you're going to get Aaron Jones back again and seeing how emotional he was, to be able to be in a position where this guy at 29 years old, at a position where everybody's just waiting, they're just, just plea, you know, teams in the NFL, the way they look at running backs in this league, they yeah. aren't given the benefit of the doubt on the back, end, back <laughs> half of their career. That's very true. This, not saying Green Bay was doing that. I'm just saying look at every running back in the National Football League, right? Unless for whatever reason your name is Raheem Mostert for some reason. But the fact is is that with five games to go in the season, as it turned out with the two playoff games, Aaron Jones was as good as he's ever been, and he was as important as he's ever been. He had the most rushing yards in the NFL during the divisional round of the playoffs. This guy cannot be judged by his position. He cannot be judged by his age. He is one of the most important players 
on this team. And Michael, when you asked me what my biggest surprise was, it was that we went through this roller coaster this year where you and I were saying all summer long, he is going to be the catalyst for, for Jordan Love. He's going to be his best friend. This guy is going to be able to help this offense transition into this new phase. He did it against Chicago, but they largely missed him for the next two months, yeah. at least on a consistent basis. Right. But you know what, Michael? When the time came for the playoffs, when the time came for this team to rally, he was right there. And I thought it made all the difference. Yeah, his 100-plus yards against San Francisco, first 100-yard rusher against the 49ers in like 50 games 50 or something games. like that. And, uh, and I actually looked this up as well. First Packers running, actually only the second running back in Packers history to have 100-plus rushing yards in back-to-back -back playoff games in the same postseason. The only other one to do it was Dorsey Levins back in 1997 when the Packers went to the Super Bowl. So... Um, uh, what you said about Aaron Jones, I agree with everything 100%. For me, what I would consider my most pleasant surprise is where the Packers got to at the tight end position yeah. this year. Yeah. Because you and I have sat here, whether we're talking pre-draft, post-draft, you know, OTAs, training camp, we've talked about how the transition at the tight end position from the college level to the NFL level is significant. There, there are so many more responsibilities that are placed on guys in terms, in terms of the, you know the duties at the line of scrimmage or when they line up, you know, split out the pass protection, the run game, the the route adjustments, everything. There is a, it's a tremendous learning learning curve at the tight end position. And Brian Gutekunst took a chance, yeah, because he went into this season with three rookie tight ends in Luke Musgrave, Tucker Craft, and Ben Sims claimed off waivers at the end of training camp. And the only veteran tight end in the room was a guy who really hadn't been an every down player, Josiah DeGuara, important guy, an important piece, but a role player yep. throughout the course of his time here in Green Bay. And even with the time that Musgrave missed due to injury, you know, what we saw, what we saw from his development, um, you know, early on, you know, guys are running the wrong routes and you see two guys in the same spot and whatever. And you look at Tucker Craft coming from a school like South Dakota State and, you know, struggling at times early on with his blocking. And then by midseason and on, you're watching the game film going, Tucker Craft is blocking some of the best pass rushers in this league yeah. one on one and protecting Jordan Love based on certain schemes and certain calls. Um, where where the Packers got to in one year with these with these rookie tight ends, where you expect there to be a much you know steeper learning curve and a longer transition, I think that sets up tremendously well for this offense because we know how much Matt Lafleur loves to use tight ends in different ways within his system and within his scheme, and I was really impressed with what the young tight ends did. Yeah, and you saw t t tons of 21 personnel uh, in that game. I should say 12 personnel, excuse me, dyslexic, um, in that game, you know, with the amount of uh, tight ends that they end up having incorporated in that. I, I was most impressed with those guys in terms of the when Brian Gutekunst drafts players, right, it's one thing to be like, oh, these are their measurables or these are their statistics. Then you go and find someone like Tucker Craft, and it's always interesting to me and fascinating to me when you can project out the way the guy's going to develop. They saw shades of what could make him special at South Dakota State, and it took time. I think he played maybe three offensive snaps in the opener, but the way his blocking came around, his yards after catch, you know, he talked all offseason about how, you know, I was a yak machine in college. That's yeah. kind of my game. And that actually manifested and developed. And then you have a guy like Luke Musgrave, who unfortunately suffers just a gruesome, god-awful injury yeah. that he, has, he misses a month with, but then finds his way back. And you can see how this guy at six foot six can be a real vertical threat against opposing defenses. It's an exciting time, man. I, I thought... And it's really the entire tight end position. Sam Laporta was just incredible for Detroit this year. Uh, Dalton Kincaid had some good snaps for Buffalo. But I, I was the guy that was always saying, yeah, that's the position that takes the longest to develop. you got to be patient with it. And now you're seeing these guys. You're seeing Trey McBride. The, the position is almost kind of shifting where guys are starting to make instant impacts again. And you saw the statistics, Michael. First time the Packers had three rookies have a tight end or have a touchdown three rookie tight ends have a touchdown in the same season. Right. And first time I believe that happened in NFL history. 
there's going to be markers like that that are you're going to see probably more and more. And the good news for Green Bay now, they solved their tight end future. I mean, yeah. these these guys, this is what you're going to build around for years to come. Yeah, they are it. There's uh, there's no doubt about it. Another big picture question I have for you. And Justin, our producer, we're going to go a little bit long today. Because yeah, sorry, Justin. I hope you didn't need to get to lunch. So hang in there with us, Justin. Um, <laughs> so we're going to make the most of this. <laughs> My other big picture picture question for you, what is your, and I hope I can f- phrase this properly, what is your biggest hope for where or how this team improves moving forward into 2024? What are you looking at? You know, I think defensively is probably where it's going to start for me. Uh, there, there's going to be, regardless of how they're going to shape things and the decisions they have to make in the months ahead, but that group had such astronomical expectations this year and we all wrote about it I wrote about it and then you sometimes forget they're still again going back to what Matt LaFleur said just because something ends a certain way doesn't mean it begins the next way yeah Uh, for as good as things ended last year for the defense it took time for them to find their groove again and honestly it took almost 13 weeks until they started to sort of really hold things down and shut things down that side of the ball is going to be very interesting to see how everything works itself out. It sounds like the Jair Alexander situation is in a much better spot. Matt LaFleur mentioned again on Monday the communication is much improved. They feel like they're going to be in a good position to continue that relationship for years to come. You saw how important Ja was in those last three games after he came back, how he toughed it out through the ankle injury to be out there for his team. But a lot of the unrestricted free agents on that for the Packers have are on that side of the ball. You know, Darnell Savage, Rudy Ford, Jonathan Owens are all going to be going into free agency. Keyshawn Nixon again is going to be coming up. They have some big decisions to make there in the secondary, seeing where things are at again with Eric Stokes. So, I, I look for the defense to sort of galvanize and crystallize and, and develop around the way they played down the final stretch. Yeah, because. I'm not saying you have to always hang your hat on the defense, but there's going to be times where you're going to need them to help set the pace with you. And I thought that was one area where Green Bay at times really did sort of struggle. Yeah, it, I'm going to I'm going to parrot a word that Matt Lafleur used, but it's also one that I have talked about, you know, in Insider Inbox on this show, other platforms with regard to the defense. And and I know it's a buzzword, but the word is consistency. Yeah. And I know that there is there is no such thing as as full consistency as we like to joke about because this is the NFL you're going to have bad days at the office like I get that you know you can't just say you you know you have to build a defense that's going to hold everybody to you know 18 points or less or whatever yeah. it doesn't work that way but the issue with this defense in my opinion over the past two seasons has been not just that it's been up and down, but that you know the the swings have the have been wildly up and then wildly down to to where you just don't really know what you're going to get. I mean, for this for this defense to play like it did in the victories over the Lions and the Chiefs that got the Packers kind of back in the hunt and yeah. back in the picture, to then follow that up with the three games against the Giants the Buccaneers and the Panthers defensively before then you can turn it back around again and get things going back the other direction. It's like I said, it's one thing to have a bad day at the office, but you can't have this level of inconsistency where when things start to go wrong, it goes wrong for three weeks. Mm -hmm. You know, that's where that, and, and I I don't know, I don't know what Matt LaFleur is going to decide big picture wise with how he wants to go forward. I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's the style of defense, something with the scheme, if it has to do with, with the leadership, whatever the case might be, he's going to make his decisions on that. But Matt LaFleur as the head coach and the offensive play caller and the guy running this thing with Jordan Love and the new franchise quarterback, he's got to have something he can rely on, on that other side. And uh, and not get into a situation where Baker Mayfield comes into Lambeau Field and puts up 158.3 or you go to Carolina, the worst team in the league, and they put up 30 points on you and you barely get out of there with a victory to keep your playoff hopes alive. That's the kind of thing that uh, as this defense played really, really well the last four games. Yeah. Minnesota, Chicago, Dallas, San Francisco. Um, on balance, the defense played really well. 
But then what was, what was it the previous three weeks when for three weeks we're waiting for the, you know, yeah. waiting and wondering what's going on with the defense. And that's when, you know, kind of it feels like this crisis mode as to what the future of the defense is going to be. The other thing I'll say with regard to consistency, of course, is the kicking game because Anders Carlson missed too many kicks. There's, there's, no, there's no two ways about that. I don't know what the Packers are going to do moving forward. I would expect potentially some competition for that job in 2024. Um, but the lack of consistency in the kicking game obviously bit the Packers in a really big moment, and you have to, you have to get to a situation where you can be a little bit more sure of yourself with as much as we believe will be on the line for yeah. this team moving forward. Yeah, and I'm a big proponent for competition. Matt LaFleur talks about it all the time. I, I always go back to what Mason Crosby talked about of 2013. 2012 did not go well at all. I mean, 61%, whatever it ended up being on his field goals. Green Bay doesn't make a major move. They don't sign anybody. They don't draft anybody, but they brought in Giorgio Tavecchio. And so many times Mason talked about how that competition kind of brought out the best in him again. It sort of allowed him to write himself, along with some of his own structural and procedural ways that he went about his kicking process. But I, I think that can do a world of good. I, I thought it did a world of good this offseason with the punting competition. Yes, Green Bay didn't necessarily need to replace Pat O'Donnell, but they found Daniel Whelan and they felt really good about this guy. And I thought on average was one of the highlights of special teams for them this season. In addition to what he did as a punter, also as a holder, I just thought, again, brought a lot of consistency in that facet. I, I think a lot of good can come out of that. The one thing I feel pretty good about with Anders is that he is not a guy that frets. You can tell he kind of has that calmness and that composure to him, much like Jordan Love. We just got to figure out the process and exactly what the, the hitch has been there. Because with some of these kicks, you're trying to look for the the common denominator, the parallel between them. And I, I really personally wasn't able to do that. I'm also not a special teams coach. Yeah. But if you can figure that out and allow him the latitude that they did this year to try to right the ship, so to speak, I think there's a lot there too. Because with the six-round pick, you are making a heavy investment into a player and you want to see the thing through as opposed to what the Vikings went through in 2018 with his brother. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, before we go, I want to get your thoughts on the rest of the playoff picture at this point. We saw Baltimore beat Houston. We saw Kansas City win at Buffalo in really another playoff classic and yet another heartbreaker for Buffalo Bills fans. Detroit wins its second playoff game, um, knocking off the Tampa Bay Buccaneers to get that shot out in San Francisco. So... Kansas City is at Baltimore. The Lions are at the 49ers. What are your thoughts on uh, what's going to happen here? Lions protect the football. They absolutely win that game. I fully believe it. Really? I, I do. I think if they if, if Jared Goff can go in there and, and keep a goose egg and that interception's calm, I think they win that game against the 49ers. See, I, I'm 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 gonna I'm I'm the I'm the opposite here. Because, you think if he throws I, an interception, they'll win? What, no. <laughs> what I was what I was gonna say is while I do believe that that the 49ers, as has been proven this year, They've they've had their struggles without Debo Samuel on offense, yep. and I don't know if they're going to have Debo Samuel for this game. But I also feel, because I watched enough of the 49ers this year, I also feel that maybe the 49ers might have gotten away with their like off game in the playoffs mm -hmm. yeah. in, in escaping last week and being able to beat the Packers and move on. And I think even without Debo Samuel, I think the 49ers are going to play much much better and I think uh, um, I, I'm not counting out the Lions but I think the Lions are going to have a really tough time winning that game. Yeah I, I really think San Francisco is a different team based on whether or not Samuel is out there. And I know Kyle Shanahan put it as 50-50 of whether or not he'll be able to play through that shoulder injury but they that passing game is different when he's not available yep. and I'm very interested to see which route they take. I, the thing I like about the Lions is I feel like they're kind of like a they're like a uh, uh, an NFL plus version of where the Packers were at this season. They had to go through their own crucibles too, but they passed it yep. and they were able to find their path into the postseason. They won that close game against the Rams. They made some mistakes against the Bucks, but still were able to pull this thing out. The Lions might have been the number one seed. Now, granted, yeah. the 49ers wouldn't have rested their guys in week 18, but the Niners, I mean, the Lions might have been the number one seed if they win that game in Dallas. Yeah, and what came right down to the wire. What's wild about that is you, you're right. They wouldn't have rested Purdy, but they may have had to rest McCaffrey in that right. game regardless with yes. the calf so yeah. it would have been very interesting to see how that would have played out yeah but 
Uh, to, to make my quick point here on all of this, whether it's the 49ers, whether it's the Lions, somebody needs to prove to me or the, Ram, or the Ravens have to have a really poor game that the Baltimore Ravens are not the best team in the National Football League. The best team doesn't always win the Super Bowl. Right. Right? Right. That's the way this thing goes. Sometimes somebody gets hot. It's a best of one tournament. That's the, <laughs> the end of it. But Baltimore, the way that the 